Saturday drying off with mostly sunny skies. Highs near 70, northwest winds at 5 to 15 miles an hour. Mostly clear Saturday night, lows in the mid-40s. Cooler on Sunday under mostly sunny skies. Highs in the upper 60s, lows in the upper 40s. Columbus Day, sunny skies, highs in the mid-60s. Lows around uh, 50 to 55 with a chance with a 60% chance of showers developing Monday night, turning down to a 40% chance of rain on Tuesday, otherwise mostly cloudy, highs in the lower 60s, mostly cloudy Tuesday night, lows in the lower 40s, for Wednesday much cooler, under partly sunny skies, highs in the middle 50s. And that, my friends, is a look at the nationwide weather forecast, or rather the Kirksville, Missouri weather forecast for today. Right now, sunny skies and 59 degrees in Kansas City, 54 at Olathe, 57 and sunny at St. Joe, 61 and sunny in Maryville, Whiteman Air Force Base, 58 degrees this morning, 63 and sunny at St. Louis International Airport, and Columbia checking in with sunny skies and 60, Kirksville reporting sunny skies and 56, 55 and sunny in Moberly. Locally, winds are out of the south at about 5 miles an hour. Relative humidity at 86%. Barometric pressure on the rise at 30.13 inches of mercury. Conditions across the region. Sunny to mostly sunny skies being reported with uh, 60 degrees in Topeka, 61 in Manhattan, six, uh, 56 rather in Chanute, uh, 60 in Wichita, 58 in Omaha, 60 in Lincoln, Falls City checking in with 56 degrees, 54 at Lamoni, and Des Moines checking in at 55 degrees. And that is a complete look at the weather forecast. Nothing on radar to report at this time. All right, coming up in a few minutes, we'll have the CBS World News Roundup for you, as well as market information from APM and Today in History, along with Celebrity Birthdays. But we're going to take a little bit of a break and come back, have the Writer's Almanac in a little bit. Following that will be uh, the Composer's Date Book. So I hope you'll stick around more of this rollicking edition of uh, First Cup is on the way. So please, I implore you to stick around. I'm your host, Joe Hafner, and you're listening to First Cup. <laughs> Today in school, I learned a lot. In chemistry, I learned that no one likes me. In English, I learned that I'm disgusting. And in physics, I learned that I'm a loser. Today in school, I learned that I'm ugly and useless. And in gym, I learned that I'm pathetic and a joke. In history, I learned that I'm trapped. Today in school, I learned that I have no friends. In English, I learned that I make people sick. And at lunch, I learned that I sit on my own because I smell. In chemistry, I learned that no one likes In biology, I learned that I'm fat and stupid. And in math, I learned that I'm trash. The only thing I didn't learn in school today... The only thing I didn't learn today... The only thing I didn't learn... ...is why no one ever helps. Kids witness bullying every day. They want to help, but they don't know how. Teach them how to stop bullying and be more than a bystander at StopBullying.gov. A message from the Ad Council. This is Linda Ronstadt. If you get high, be sure you don't die. Some drugs speed you up and some drugs slow you down. And booze makes it all the more dangerous. Watch out for the things that might wreck you or your pickup truck. There needs to be a change. In the way that you look at me. In the way we look at ourselves. In the way we look at all transgender people. The misunderstanding. The cruelty. The cruelty. The violence. The violence. Needs to end. Learn about who we are. Learn about who you are. And in the end, we may not look so different at all. And here is the Writer's Almanac for Thursday, the 10th of October, 2013. 
It's the birthday of Giuseppe Verdi, born in a village in Parma, Italy, 1813. Parents ran a tavern, but they recognized musical talent in the boy. They bought him a little piano, which he kept for the rest of his life, became organist at his church, went off to a nearby town, boarded with a wealthy grocer who liked him and wanted to support him, and whose daughter Verdi ended up marrying. He wrote an opera, Oberto, which was performed at La Scala, the most important theater in Italy, 1839. He was just 26 years old, and then tragedy struck. His wife died, encephalitis. Verdi had already lost two children in infancy, said he would never write music again. But then someone sent him the powerful libretto for Nabucco, and he could not resist it. He turned it into an opera which premiered 1842, audience applauded for ten minutes after the first scene. Verdi used the same librettist for his next opera, Lombardi, a librettist who tended to put off going to work. Verdi locked him in a room to get him to write on time, once made the mistake of locking him in the room with his wine collection. Verdi wrote a total of 26 operas, including Rigoletto, La Traviata, Aida, and Falstaff. It's the birthday of the playwright Harold Pinter, born East London, 1930. Went to the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts in London, didn't like it, left after a couple of years. First full-length play was The Birthday Party, which debuted in the West End, which, like many of Pinter's plays, came to be called Comedies of Menace, Ordinary Situations Turning Ominous or Absurd for inexplicable reasons. His big hit was The Homecoming, 1965, about a man who brings his wife home to meet his all-male family, and she stays with the family to be their caretaker and prostitute. Pinter said that after the opening of The Homecoming in New York in 1967, was one of the greatest theatrical nights of his life. Wealthy audience, women in mink, men in tuxedos. As soon as the curtain opened, they hated the play. The great thing was, Pinter said, the actors went on and hated the audience back even more. It's the birthday of the novelist and short story writer R. K. Narayan, born in Madras, India, 1906, author of Swami and Friends and other books. He was a close friend of Graham Greene, though they met only once briefly in London. They carried on a correspondence for years and years, and it took them around 15 years to go from Dear Mr. Narayan and Dear Graham Greene to Dear Narayan and Dear Graham. Here's a poem for today by Edna St. Vincent Millay, Afternoon on a Hill. I will be the gladdest thing under the sun. I will touch a hundred flowers and not pick one. I will look at cliffs and clouds with quiet eyes, watch the wind bow down the grass and the grass rise. And when lights begin to show up from the town, I will mark which must be mine and then start down. Edna St. Vincent Millay's poem, Afternoon on a Hill, from her selected poems published by Harper Perennial and used by permission here on the Writer's Almanac, supported by the Poetry Foundation. You can turn your iPhone or Android into a virtual poetry library with the Poetry Foundation's Poetry app, available to everyone online at poetryfoundation.org slash mobile. And by Quercus, publisher of Stephen Brumwell's George Washington Gentleman Warrior, a fresh new account of the secrets behind George Washington's revolutionary success. In bookstores everywhere, Quercus, stories worth reading, books worth recommending. Produced by Joy Biles with assistance from Kathy Roach, be well, do good work, and keep in touch. This is the Composer's Datebook for October 10th. I'm John Zeck. 
We have a special birthday anniversary to celebrate today. It's the 200th anniversary of the birth of the great 19th century Italian opera composer Giuseppe Verdi. At least October 10th is the date we choose to celebrate these days. Apparently Verdi's mother told him he was born on October 9th. And since he assumed mom knew best, Verdi always celebrated the 9th as his birthday, even when he later learned that a church registry indicated the date was more likely October 10th. Verdi was born in Parma in 1813 when that part of Italy was under French rule. So Giuseppe Fortunino Francesco Verdi was registered at birth as Joseph Fortunin Francois. His parents were dirt poor, but when Verdi died at the age of 87 in 1901, he was the most famous Italian of his time and his funeral was a state event involving thousands. Verdi completed 37 operas, and alongside Richard Wagner, who was also born in 1813, Verdi's considered the most influential opera composer of the 19th century. In his day, Wagner's admirers called the German composer's operas more progressive than Verdi's more traditional works. But in his defense, Verdi's fans would probably quote a line that Hans Sachs sings in Wagner's opera Die Meistersinger, Verachtet mir die Meister nicht, which translates something like, Don't diss the old masters. Or as Verdi himself put it in one of his letters, Tornate all'antico e sarà un progresso, which in English means, Let's turn to the past, and that will be progress. Composer's Datebook is produced by APM, American Public Media, in conjunction with the American Composers Forum, reminding you that all music was once new. This is Across Our Wide Missouri with Bob Pretty. The yellow right EX flyer hangs in the Air and Space Museum in Washington, the green letters on the underside of its lower wings spelling the name of the grape soft drink Vin Fizz. Visitors see it from a perspective similar to that of Missourians in 1911, when many of them saw their first airplane making a historic flight. The story in a minute. Cal Hi friends, Joe Hafter here. Are you interested in buying, selling, trading, or renting a house? Or maybe you're in the market for buying or selling a car, or perhaps selling or giving away clothes, furniture, or electronics. Well, I can help you out. Just email me, joe at Gunther's House of Friends at gmail.com. That's Gunther's House of Friends at gmail.com. Email me today with your item and or items, and together we'll come up with a creative way to buy, sell, trade, or rent any reasonable item or service that you want. Keep in mind, though, I don't deal with the exchange of firearms, alcohol items, drugs, or anything illegal or immoral. So send me an email today at Gunther's House of Friends at gmail.com. In a minute. Calbraith Perry Rogers was the great grandson of the Commodore Perry who opened Japan to commerce, a grand nephew of Captain Oliver Hazard Perry, the famous naval officer in the War of 1812, the grandson of the superintendent of the Naval Academy, and the son of a man killed fighting Indians six months before Cal was born. In August of 1911, with just 90 minutes of training from the Wright brothers, he won $11,000 at the Chicago Air Show by flying more than 24 hours in nine days. Now he was competing for William Randolph Hearst's $50,000 prize for the first person to fly coast to coast in 30 days or less. His airplane had two propellers driven by one four-cylinder engine. He sat upright without seat belt or windshield, protected only by goggles. For each mile he flew advertising Armour's soft drink, he was paid $5. He took off from the racetrack in New York and survived crashes of various kinds at his first four stops. He became the first pilot to take a plane into a thunderstorm and survive. He called the experience similar to riding through an electric gridiron. The Hearst Prize was already gone, though, by the time he reached Missouri, more than 30 days after takeoff. But he promised to finish the flight if canvas, steel, and wire together with a little brain, a little brawn, tendon, and brain stick with me. He refused to fly to St. Louis because the city refused to pay him $1,000. Instead, he crossed the Mississippi River near Louisiana, Missouri, heading for Mexico landed at Thompson near Columbia to fix a spark plug and add some fuel, and he canceled his landing at Mexico because of the fences at the fairgrounds and the roughness of the field. He circled the town a few times and headed on to Marshall, where an airplane had never been seen before. The flight from Springfield, Illinois to Marshall set a new record for the longest distance flown in one day, 235 miles, and his total distance since leaving New York reached 1,434 miles, 
breaking a record set by Harry Atwood on a St. Louis to New York flight in August. At Higginsville the next day, people climbed onto the roofs of almost every business building hoping to see the plane. Rogers circled twice and went on. Whistles blew a few minutes later in Higginsville so people could leave their homes and jobs to see the plane fly.